Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. I'm Nick. This is MSFS Flight Plans. You're here, I'm here. Now let's get down to the business of saving the entire human population through the amazing world of flight simulation. Today we have yet another spectacular member-recommended region of the planet to explore. We are in northern Ethiopia, and once again, this is a location I never would have thought to check out on my own. But man, oh man, am I glad we're out here because it is unbelievably cool. You guys are not... If you haven't flown down low, close to the ground in northern Ethiopia, this is just unbelievable in africa central africa of all things this is just crazy but there aren't a whole lot of airports in this part of the world so you're going to have a bit of a hike no matter where you're going so i picked out the mitsubishi mu2 for us because it's pretty quick and i don't feel too weird flying something like this closer to the train and it's been a while since we've had this thing out i think it was probably the hawaii flight i forgot i even had it i uninstalled it to save some disk space but here we are we got it again very unique plane and as you can see it looks like two gigantic engines with a tiny little airplane attached to it very, very powerful climber, not so powerful getting off the runways you're about to see. So let's hop in and get her started up real quick, and then we'll take a look at the Google map. I have pre-configured some of the things, so I don't have to jump around with the camera too much. So let's go ahead and get her started up. Oh, then we need the battery. That's going to help. Hopefully it'll still start up without me having to click that. I think we'll probably be okay. So we just need to wait for the oil pressure. Yeah, it's going. All right, the oil pressure hits 40. We introduce the fuel. That left engine should start up. We'll do the same thing with the right, and then we'll check out the Google map, and off we'll go. But I just love these planes where they have the weather look to them just great. And they had the courtesy of not making the windows also all dirty. You guys know how I feel about that. Love seeing the dry rot on the glare shield. Not so much scratches and swirls all over the windshields. Okay, whoa, that's really good. We're good to go there. So introduce the fuel. Start her up, baby. Okay, that one's going. That should get fired up here in just a second. And we'll go ahead and just turn the generator on. And just to get all of our avionics going, we'll go ahead and get the inverter on. Okay, that's good. So let's go ahead and get the right engine going. And start her up. Just get that fuel pressure up. Not much to do right now. Let's go ahead and check our barrow. Our cruising altitude ultimately is going to be 14,000 feet. So I'm going to go ahead and set that now. We're going to get up to 10,000 and kind of hold there for just a little bit. But we are definitely going to need to be at 14,000 to cross over these mountains up here. Okay, so that's good. And that's good. So introduce the fuel. That was the generator. Fuel. Come on, Nick. This is what happens when I cannot see. I don't want to have to keep doing this to see what's down there. I'm doing this by memory. I got some muscle memory, even though it's been a while since we've flown this thing. Okay, is that thing spinning up? Yep, it's good. Okay, so let's get this going. Then we'll take a look at the map real quick, just to show you where we are and where we're going. Go ahead and get the transponder on and get our yoke back in there. All right, that should be ready for us to taxi once we get to that part of it. Okay, so here's Africa. And one thing I just want to show you, because I'm going to mention it later. Here's Ethiopia. So the equator runs right about through here. It's just north of the equator. Take a look at the size of that versus a lot of these other countries around here. I'm going to make some commentary about the size of Ethiopia versus other places in the world. And just kind of, just look at that. Compared to some other places, India, Australia, Russia, China, all those huge, huge places. Just kind of put that in the shelf because we're going to come back to that. So we're up here in the northern part of it. And the big feature up here is Lake Tana, which we're going to land just north of that. But we're going to start up here by Axum. And the airport is just to the east of town. We're right here, so we're going to take off this way, come up over here, cruise down the side of it so we can get a good look at Axum. And i got a lot to tell you about that place. It's going to be right there when we take off, so I'm going to kind of keep telling you about it as we fly past it. And then we're going to get up here into this really hilly and canyony terrain, which is just unbelievable. And I'm going to mention this also. We're going to come way over here because it doesn't look great to fly over it. I initially was going to fly over this reservoir. It doesn't look great. I'll tell you about that. We'll just see it off in the distance because we're going to come down this way, come across this ridge right here, and then take a look at this canyon, which is just unbelievable. We'll see that mountain right there. There's something interesting about that place, I'll tell you. Then we're going to come over this way, cruise up here to along this ridge, just north of Amba Georgis, if that's how you say that. And then we're going to come right over the top of these mountains and come down and land at Gondar Airport and check out the town of Gondar. There's an uh, Insim POI here and one in Axum. I'll show you both of those, both of historical significance. So we're going to kind of cut off this ridge down here, come over this way just to get a good look at that. And then we're going to come down this way. Originally, I was going to fly in from here because there's not mountains at about 9,000 feet here, maybe even 10,000. So we're going to have to come down pretty quick to get to that. So originally, I was going to come down this way and come up here because it's a lot flatter. But the only spot out here on this whole trip where I saw bad scenery, a bunch of flat buildings that we can very easily see right here. We're coming in for our approach. This whole area is totally flat, very colorful, but very flat. And then right along here on this side of the runway, there are some of those cliffs that aren't supposed to be there in real life, like just a square block sticking up in the air. So we'll avoid all that by just coming in right here and then pull on over into the airport. And the sim said this flight would be about 40 minutes. We'll see. We're going to have a bit of a tailwind. This is the live weather. 
And I'll tell you about the add-ons in just a second. Let me make sure everything else looks good to go. Check our barrel one more time. Get our taxi lights on. If we even have them. I know we have landing lights in this thing. Okay, I think we're good to go. Let's go ahead and start moving. We're just going to follow this yellow line over there of the runway. Parking brake off. So one of the interesting things about flying this plane is that it can climb, if you saw that Hawaii flight, you already know this, at about 3,500 feet a minute. It's insane how hard this thing can climb. But good luck getting off of a run runway that is less than about 7,000 feet. We're barely going to clear this one. It's about 8,000. Now, granted, look at our altitude. We're almost at 7,000 feet right now, so bear that in mind if you're taking a naturally aspirated plane. But this thing struggles to get off the ground. No problem climbing, and it could land on a really, really short runway. But you're going to need something long to take off with. So as far as add-ons go, we have one available for this airport and the one that we're coming into, but all they do is modify the runway and parking lines as far as the description said. Maybe a little touch-up of the terminal building. But I have got my graphics just cranked. You should be able to crank them too. I'm getting 50 frames per second with everything at Ultra and the terrain level of detail at 250, which is higher than I would normally usually go because it doesn't make that much of a difference, but I figured why the heck not if we can get it. Look at that mountain over there. Even that looks great. So I didn't put those two add-ons in. If you just search for the ICAO codes in flightsim.to, they are freeware, so you can get those in here. And then I am using the latest Bing map in the map enhancement application because the default map, which is also Bing, but apparently not the latest one, will give you some of that patchwork quilt looking blotchy stuff on some of the mountains, which will totally break your immersion. So if you don't have the map enhancement application, you can get that for free, stick it in there. I've been using it a lot in some parts of the world. It makes a huge difference. Definitely does out here. And then the Bing latest version of the map is the one I selected, which is also free, so you'll have to pay nothing to get this flight to look just like what you're about to see here, which will look incredible. All right, get ourselves turned around. And I'll take as much runway as I can get. I probably could have taken even a little bit more. Okay, just a few more checks real quick. We need to set our CDI on this top one to GPS or it's not going to work. And sometimes when I load in, they'll both already be set on GPS, and then sometimes it won't be. This one will be on the V-Lock, and that one will be GPS, so you got to make sure that one's on GPS. Okay, taxi lights off, landing lights on. We need 20 degrees of flaps. Advance our condition levers to take off. Check our barrel one more time. And I'm ready to rock and roll. You guys ready to do this? Let's go. Now watch how slow the indicated airspeed creeps up. It's crazy. <laughs> You'd think this thing would just be a rocket with all that power and so little weight. But nope, not getting off the ground. If anyone's ever flown one of these in real life or knows more about them in real life than I do, let me know if that's accurate. It's something just seems off about that, taking that much time for that rollout. Just seems crazy. And you know what? I need to adjust our trim just a little bit, so let's bring that up just a hair. That'll help us get off the ground. But not much. All right, we're just now coming up on 80 knots, that is. Come on, baby. Anytime you want. We're ready. And rotate speed is 115, but I'm going to start giving it some back pressure at around 100 because I don't think we're going to hit 115 by the end of this runway. Keeping my heels firmly planted on the ground, lest I barely touch the brakes in this thing. All right, let's start rotating. There we go. There we go. All right, gears up. And one notch of flaps up, get that autopilot on. And we'll set the vertical speed for 2,000 feet a minute just so we don't get going too fast. Flaps all the way up, landing lights off, and we'll pull those throttles back, get that exhaust temperature down to the green zone there. And at about 50 on the torque pressure should be about right. So we'll see how it's looking there with our exhaust temperature. That's the only thing that's going to creep out of the green, but we'll try to keep it right down in there. All right, we'll just leave it right there. That should be good. Okay, so we just departed from Axum Airport, just to the east of the town of Axum. And there's no particular reason why I picked that airport other than that it was a good fit for our flight plan. But I was delighted to discover that this place is a pretty big deal from a historical standpoint. Look at these down here already. We're going to see terracing and great looking riverbeds without that blocky AI generated line going through the water. Just truly incredible. The oldest signs of settled population down here go back to around the 7th century BC when it was likely a regional trading hub. But by the turn of the first millennium, it would become the capital city of the Aksumite Empire and regarded as a metropolis by commentators of the era. 
Now, please be honest with me, guys. How many of you have ever heard of the Aksumite Empire? If you have, let me know how and why you heard about that, because I never have. But after digging into the research for this flight, I discovered these guys were a really big deal back in their heyday. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and set this initially for 10,000, because on my test flight, I forgot to stop at 10,000, so we'll make sure it does that for us. There we go. We don't want to get too high here, so we can see all these terrain details. So, once again, this is the reason why we do what we do around here, and why it's so valuable to me. If it wasn't for simming, I never would have stumbled across the Aksumite Empire, which is something I feel like anyone with an interest in world history should be aware of, for reasons you'll very shortly understand. So there's Aksum right over there. And one thing I just want to point out to you, that little church right there is an NSIM POI, a very significant place, which I'll tell you about here in just a minute. And there's another spot down here I was trying to pick out in the sim, which I will show you on the satellite map. I'll mention this too. That might be it right there. So that church right there and this thing here, the two things that I'm going to talk about here as we plow away from Axum. Doesn't look too bad. It looked a little bit better, a little bit more lifelike when I had the Google map, but the Google map terrain was not nearly as good as this. So I went with this one. For some reason, the Google map buildings look a little bit more lifelike in most areas. But these guys out here were regarded as such a force in the 3rd century AD that they were widely regarded as one of the four great world powers, along with Persia, China, and Rome. And the kingdom held itself together all the way into the Middle Ages, outliving the Persian and Roman empires. So of course I was trying to figure out why some village out in Ethiopia, of all places, could gain so much power and influence in the world. And it turns out it had everything to do with their position along a main trade route between Rome and India which eventually grew so powerful that Axum had a monopoly on the entire Indian Ocean trade. So I don't know if you caught it on the world map, but we're right next to that channel that runs to the west of Saudi Arabia, which would go up into the Mediterranean, which I guess is how they get up to Rome, and then they'd spit down in the Indian Ocean. That's how they get over to India, and they'd have to come right by here, although this isn't necessarily on the coast. So they must have had some sprawl going out there. So just to zoom out a little bit, when you think of this area today, if you're like me, you probably imagine Saudi Arabia as the region's power player, which it certainly is. And I think that's kind of what jaded my perception of its history. But prior to the oil boom of the 1970s and OPEC and all that, Saudi Arabia didn't have nearly the wealth and influence it currently enjoys. I imagine it was probably nothing more than a sweltering dust pit when Axum was calling the shots back in the day. Shoot, back then, Islam wasn't even a religion yet, so they didn't even have all the pilgrimage sites in Saudi Arabia going for them. You can see a little bit of the terracing starting here. This is nothing. This is not even close to the best of it. It really gets good up in these mounds up here, but this looks pretty good. The only thing that seems a little bit off, and it may even be true to life, the dirt does appear to be pretty red out here, so they probably have a lot of iron content, but some of these fields look a little bit too green, but you can definitely see the relief on the vegetation out there. Not a whole lot of photographic trees or any of that nonsense. We're going to start seeing some riverbeds up here that look pretty cool. So, while we're on the subject of religion, you guys ready for another shocker? Axum, along with the Roman Empire, was the first culture to adopt Christianity as a state religion, although Rome beat them out by just a few decades. And I know all of you raiders of lost things out there are surely aware that the Ark of the Covenant is purported to have been covertly removed from Jerusalem sometime before the first century, maybe even a few hundred years before that, maybe during the time of Solomon, there are some rumors. You probably also heard that there is a place in Ethiopia that claims to have it. Well, that place is the Church of Mary of Zion, and it is that one I just showed you back there in Axum. <laughs> I had no idea that was it. I've seen so many documentaries about that thing, and I just never caught that. It was, look at this terracing here. Never caught the name of the place, I guess, or if I did, I didn't make the connection to this flight. Look at that. Okay, so here's some of the riverbeds. Look, no AI water in there. Looks like a real riverbed. Beautiful. So if that's not shocking enough to encourage you to fly out here and see all this for yourself, there is a big archaeological site, which was that second thing I showed you, that square-looking thing called Dungar, just to the west of town. And again, I'll show it to you what it really looks like on the satellite map at the end. But that is believed to be the palace of the Queen of Sheba herself. How incredible is that? Just amazing. They think she might have had several of them, but they think that was probably one of them. Look at this river. Look at that. It's perfect. Just perfect. If you saw that K2 flight, I was lamenting about that big block of water they put down that thing that should have probably looked a lot like that up in the mountains. So I don't know if this terracing is a natural feature or not, because you're going to see a lot of spots that are way too steep for anyone to be farming it, and there's no habitation near it, so that might be a natural landscape feature out here. This is the live weather, by the way. 
it looks really cool. Most of the year, there's not a lot of clouds out here unless you're flying during the summertime. And we got about an eight knot crosswind right now. Not too bad. The decline of Aksum started around the 7th century AD with the rise of Muslim influence in the region, and it collapsed completely in roughly 960 AD. And even though it lost a lot of its political clout, things moved along pretty nicely out here for the next thousand years, and it was widely regarded as a beautiful place to live and visit. But all that changed in the 19th century when local warlords started slugging out with all their neighbors. And then they had a big civil war in the 20th century and some serious carnage during another uprising called the Tigray War. This region out here we're just flying out of now is called Tigray. And that war started in 2020. And there are some reports that as many as 800 civilians may have been massacred in Axum during that one. So pretty nasty. And if you look on the, if you're not landing at that airport or taking off from it, and you can actually see the airport in little nav map, because you know it'll block it out if you're landing there, taking off there. You can see that airport got the Mosul treatment. If you saw our Iraq flight, they carved a bunch of big channels across it with bulldozers to make it unusable. But then if you check out a Google map, you can see that they've filled it in with asphalt. So I'm guessing you could probably use it again now. Wouldn't it be something if they modeled that in the sim? That'd be cool. Way off in the distance here, that's where that big reservoir is. And the Takizi River is what runs out of that. It's actually the border between Tigray and the, the area we're about to come into here, which I'll tell you in a minute. There's a huge dam they built out there in 2009. It looks horrible in the sim. You can't even see it, which was just breaking my heart. I think it's the biggest dam in Ethiopia. And then the water out here just looks really, really bad, which was a total bummer. But that's cool because we got the lead from Axum and all that stuff looks really cool out here. So not complaining too much. Wish they would have touched that up some. Maybe 2024. Look at this stuff. So despite being the site of all that incredible history and wealth and power and influence, today the population of Axum is less than 70,000 people. And you know when I hear things like that, I often wonder if someone will tell a similar story about places like London or Washington, D.C. a thousand years from now. Assuming humanity can make it that long. Oh, we've got just one spot where they put the extra water in there. Look at that. So this is the Takizi River here. This would run up all the way to the dam. And if you want to take a cool flight, this thing is about 300 miles long, this river, if you keep going back behind us there. And it runs through the Takizi River Gorge, which is the deepest in all of Africa. Some parts of it get up to 6,000 feet from the top. So that would probably be a fun little flight in a uh, bush plane or something like that. I didn't try it, but judging by how good this looks, I'm guessing it would probably look pretty neat. Okay, let's go ahead and reset this for 14,000 and start that climb, because we're going to need to be up there or we're going to run into something. And we'll climb at 2,000 feet a minute again. Check our barrel again. Everything looking good, except I didn't push the altitude setting on that. All right, that's good. How are we doing on our exhaust temp? Looking good. All right, everything seems to be set pretty well. Now, when you see these mountains up here, unlike the Rockies, Alps, and pretty much everywhere else in the sim, these things are going to have razor-sharp edges, which is just awesome. Again, I don't know how they can do that in some parts of the world and not most of the world, but they definitely did it out here. Especially this thing. So getting back to the Ark for a minute. The object, wherever it is, has had a profound and foundational impact on Christianity in Ethiopia. Each of the churches out here, the Ethiopian Orthodox churches, are built according to something called a tripartite model. Similar in design to the temple in Jerusalem. And in the center of the church is the Holy of Holies, just like the original temple, where they keep a replica of the Ark and only the priests are allowed in there, just like at the original temple. And that's how all of those churches out here operate, with the Ark at the center. So whether the original is out here or not, it has obviously made its mark on the region. Now this is another cool thing. We're going to come up to these, and it's just going to keep getting higher and higher. And you're going to see population on top of all these little plateaus out here. And I don't really see a whole lot of roads. I mean, they must have little dirt paths or something going up there, but there's so much land down in these valleys, I don't know why they decided to build stuff up here. Except for the view must be absolutely incredible. So here's some more of that terracing. Look at this. I mean, what do you think? You got plenty of flat land down up here. And they do have some farms. Or down up here. Down there. Look at that. So there'll be a few spots like this. And I think it's just because there was so much shadow in the satellite map. Where we'll get some completely dark spots like this. There's going to be a few more up here. We won't really see it because we're going to fly right over it. Let's hop outside the plane real quick. That is unbelievable. That puts the Grand Canyon to shame. At least the 2020 version of the canyon. 
Wait, do you see this thing? We're gonna once we come over the top of this, we're gonna see the best looking canyon. I think I've seen some. Yep, there's another big black spot. But look at this up here. Look at that. Can you imagine living there? What the view would be like? So if we're at fourteen thousand feet now, that's got to be what twelve thousand feet. That's way up there. Maybe that's why all these guys are so good at running marathons. They train in almost zero oxygen conditions. These guys in the Kenyans. Although I don't think Kenya has the altitude Ethiopia does. Back in Axum, there is just one priest, which is where the supposed original Ark is. But there's one priest who is the appointed guardian for life to watch over the Ark. And he is never allowed to leave the property. And he has to appoint his successor overseer before he dies. And this one guy is the only one who is ever allowed to see the Ark. Not even the head of the Ethiopian church can take a peek. It's just that one guy. Let me, uh, let me jump to some of our other camera views. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, a little bit of photographic treeing over there. And a little bit of rounded mountaintop. Well, let's just stay on this side of the plane. There we go. That's more like it. Okay, so just make a note to yourself. Stay on the left side of your plane. And by the way, if you like this flight and you want to take it just like we are, as always, this exact flight plan will be included in the video description. Just open it up in a little nav map and go to town. If you don't know how to do that, check out our how-to section of the YouTube channel. I've got a couple of very brief tutorials that'll get right to the point, get you up and running a little nav map, show you how to import the flight plans, all that stuff, get you up and running real quick. Very, very valuable tool if you like doing stuff like this in the sim. Look at that little population center. Look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Unbelievable. I'd say I'd love to come out here, but they can't seem to stop bombing each other. Not a real safe place to travel. At least not recently. So if you're like me, this whole bit with the Ark and only one person being allowed to see it kind of got me thinking about the veracity of all that. So I was thinking, on the one hand, if it really was in there, why wouldn't anyone ever be allowed to see it, even the head of the church in Ethiopia? But if it's not in there, what kind of person would imprison themselves to those couple of acres for life for something that they would have to surely know is a lie if they're in there looking at whatever's in there? So don't know what's up with that. And because I'm such a nerd about things like this, I probably watched half a dozen documentaries about that church back there. And I don't know how I never noticed the name of the town, but I guess I wasn't paying attention to that. I was too focused on the Ark. But now you can see you've almost been there in real life. But in the documentaries, the hosts were going around to some different locations out here, all in this area, looking at some different features. So if you ever see one of those pop up on your streaming feed, check it out. Pretty interesting. So this area right here, we'll get some more of that black stuff. Again, I think it's because of the shadows. But after we get over this, that's pretty much the last of that we're going to see, too. So obviously we've got some incredible terrain out here, and I thought the geology of this region was pretty interesting too. By the way, this is the highest mountain in Ethiopia. It's called Ras Dashan. Gets up to about 15,900 feet or so, I think. And this area is called Simeon's National Park. I'll tell you about that in a little bit too. So we're going to cut right through this notch here and then check out this incredible canyon on the other side. So getting back to the geology. Even though Ethiopia sits just north of the equator today, it's probably at about between maybe 7 and 12 degrees latitude north. This place was hanging out at the South Pole for about 300 million years before it started sliding north at the end of the Triassic period. And it made its way up here, going through several phases of being crisscrossed by riverbeds as all kinds of glaciers were melting away. And then after that, it sank completely underwater. Look at this. Even up close, you've still got some relief here. Look at that. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, from 500 feet away, we start to lose it a little bit, but this is the only spot we'll be that close. This is incredible up here. I'm going to say that 10 more times, just to make sure you believe me when you actually see it, as if you need to be convinced. But once it sank underwater, it didn't re-emerge again until about 30 million years ago, so most of the fossils you'd probably find out here today, and it sounds like there's probably no shortage of fossils, would be the types of critters you'd see scurrying along the bottom of shallow oceans, because that's what all this was for quite a while. And I figured with the height of all these mountains and how jagged they are, that maybe there was some plate convergence or something going on out here that would have created some uplift. But it sounds like pretty much all of this is just from water erosion and a little bit of volcanic activity. They think actually this mountain back here may have once been on the eastern rim of a gigantic volcano. They have not confirmed that, but there's some speculation that that might be what this originally was. Of course, it looks nothing like that now. Been quite watered down. And this thing here is called the Mishasha River, and it winds its way down there and then catches up with the Tekizi again, which is the one that fills up that big reservoir. What do you think of that? 
Good grief, there's a little river down there which also looks just incredible. So I wonder if there's like a certain threshold of river width that causes it to put that big line of fake water in there. I mean, just leave it off. It looks fine. Remove that code from the AI. And that appears to be correct also. Usually it's inverted where it's green here and then more bald up there, but that also looked pretty accurate on the maps. And I don't know what all these little white spots are out here. I figured they might be like a little house or something on them, but there doesn't appear to be, so maybe they're animal pens or something. Little areas for the chickens to scratch. There, there's some more of that terracing. Look at that. Let's get outside again. This is probably going to be where I get my thumbnail from. Look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Man. Getting a little bit of turbulence over these mountains. Yeah, we got about a 15 knot crosswind now. We're getting some gusts too. So it'll be a little bit bumpy. But not too bad. So again, this is the Simeon Mountains National Park. And it seems to be, they, I'm guessing here with this, that they may have called it Simeon because there's a bunch of baboon species that live out here. But Simeon is not spelled how we would spell it, but I don't know if there's just been a little bit of distortion of that. But if that's not what it has anything to do with, I don't know why it's called Simeon. But there are a lot of monkeys out here. And I bet they steal a lot of things too. And sling poop, of course. Always good to capture some video of that if you can get it. Maybe you can find one smoking like that. <laughs> Where was that zoo up in Atlanta or something that gorilla was smoking all the time? One of my favorite YouTube videos of all time. I think he actually died, unfortunately. But that's what happens. Okay, so now I'm going to set this for 11,000 feet. And we'll come on down there because the terrain's going to drop a little bit for us here. And we'll come down to 1,000 feet a minute. I'm just going to keep an eye on that airspeed as we do that. I'll pull the throttle back just a little bit. So this region now, we were in Tigray before. This is called Amhara. More terracing down there. I bet that's a natural feature. Because there's just too many of that, those markings going up the sides of really steep, sharp edges, and I can't imagine someone's trying to farm that. Look at this. Yeah, there's no farms on that. I wonder what causes that. Maybe wind erosion? It's definitely cool, isn't it? Alright, we've got nothing but beautiful scenery to enjoy for the next 30 or 40 miles, so I dug up some interesting facts about Ethiopia to make you the envy of the pub at your next trivia night. Some of the most ancient archaeological discoveries on Earth seem to indicate that all of us can very likely trace our common lineage to this region. The earliest example of tool use by early humans was found in Ethiopia, and in 1972 a couple of paleoanthropologists found a 3.2 million year old hominid skeleton. You may have even heard about it in history class. They named her Lucy. She was from out here. And she's about half a skeleton if you've ever seen a picture of her, and not very tall either. Ethiopia is the only African country that no one managed to bring under colonial control. And apparently the locals aren't shy about reminding visitors of that fact. As I'll tell you about in a minute, the Italians came out here for a little while in World War II, but the Brits took care of that with some very large bombs. Another great looking river. Look at that. <laughs> I absolutely love it. What a gem this is. I might rank this as a must-fly flight. This is just amazing. Mainly because it's just an area I would have never thought to fly over. It's like this has been out here all along, and we never flew over it. This country has the second highest population on the continent of Africa, obviously, with only Nigeria beating out. They've got roughly 130 million out here, but Nigeria has almost double that figure. And on the world stage, Ethiopia is ranked 10th for population. I know some of you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot for such a small country, but that's why I was showing it to you on the map initially. We can once again thank a Mercator projection map, which is pretty much anything you're looking at that's flat for Ethiopia looking small by comparison. It is the 26th largest in the world by land area. I also found that shocking. I would have never thought that. Look at this here. Another great river. Unbelievable. I didn't fly down there to check out what this thing is, but you can definitely see it sticking. We'll see a couple other little spots as we're coming around here that just kind of pop up like that with real dark stuff on the top. I don't, I'm guessing that's probably trees. This one up here is treed over on the top. But an interesting formation. But all these people in this country without great infrastructure is not a great cocktail for quality of life. This country has one of the lowest life expectancies in the world at just 66 years of age on average. And I think the pervasive AIDS epidemic and extreme poverty has a lot to do with that. And Ethiopia is also one of the top 10 poorest countries on the planet. I think in the early 2000s, they were the third poorest 
on the planet. But there might be one silver lining to all that. Being able to consume, on average, only 1,800 calories a day makes the population out here the leanest on Earth. So I would recommend setting up shop somewhere else if you're going into cardiology. And I think for some reason I was reading that two days of the week, something about the religion out here, they don't eat meat two days of the week either. So a lot of vegetarian meals. And I came across a semi-related stat the other day that I actually wrote down so I could share with you guys. I just didn't know when I would do it, but this is a perfect time to do it. In 1950, the average life expectancy in the United States, I think you guess it what it was, 1950. So not that long ago, probably within a lot of y'all's lifetimes. Just 67 years old in 1950. And today it's at 78, which has actually come down a little bit thanks to COVID. And all of us eating too much meat out here, probably. So that means probably a lot of us have a lot more simming to do before we check out, which is good news. And here's something I know you guys are going to love. In 2012, Ethiopian Airlines became the first in Africa and the second company in the world to purchase and fly a 787 Dreamliner. Never would have thought that either. All right, I think I've, I want to hop out this other... I think it's going to look good out of the right side of the plane, so let's just take a quick peek. If it's bad, I'll jump right back over real quick. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's what I want to see right there. So I think I'm going to take that bush plane flight down that river. I want to see a gorge that's 6,000 feet high. And some parts of it get really narrow, too. You might get almost like a Victoria Falls gorge kind of thing going out here. And you know what? To be honest with you, other than having the Jefferson pack in there, which makes that area look incredible, I would bet this probably looks better just by default. So if you did have the default map in there, as we were coming into that big park with the big tall mountains and all that, you would be seeing the patchwork stuff all over the place. It would really disappoint you. So that, let that be a little bit of encouragement if you haven't tried the map enhancement yet to throw that thing in there. Super easy to use. And if any of you guys want to know how to set it up, just drop me a line. I'll, I'll walk you through it really easy. It would be worth my time to get you in there because it makes a big difference in many parts of the world. We're actually facing the wrong direction right now. Look, there's where the seat is, but I wanted to look out the front of the plane towards the front of it anyway. All right, so sticking with our aviation theme, in 1962, an Ethiopian named Asejadek Asifa was the first African female to pilot an airplane. And in the year 2000, Aster Tolosa, also Ethiopian, became the first female pilot ever to shoot down an enemy plane in combat. They had some kind of dust up out here and she shot somebody down. I don't know what she was flying though. Oh no, look, we got a little bit of stretching right there. All right, I'm just gonna pretend I didn't see that. Look at this riverbed. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I can't imagine 2024 looking much better than this, and from what I've seen, most of it doesn't. So this is really top-tier stuff here. If it looks just this good, I will be just beside myself. This is great. If they could just stretch this down to the northern and southern latitudes where we start to get that rough satellite coverage, which it sounds like they've done, I will be a happy camper for sure. And finally, one final tidbit for anyone thinking about a trip out here in real life. You better check your watch because they have two time bands every day. One begins at dawn and ends at dusk, while the other starts at dusk and ends at sunrise. And I couldn't get like an example of how that works, but I'm wondering if they adjust that every single day because obviously that changes a little bit, which you would think would make it very difficult. So they said, if you're going to be flying anywhere, make sure you check the airport and see which kind of time they're using. Because if you're on the wrong one, you're not going to catch a flight. They call this area the Roof of Africa because it has the highest on average terrain in the whole continent too, with very few spots out here dipping below 5,000 feet. All right, so let me look at little nav map and see what our terrain map looks like. So we need to get down to about 9,500, which we come up when we come to our next town, which is gonna be Gondar. So let me get our announcements out of the way real quick, and then we'll start setting up for that. So again, I know not many people ever scroll down through the description page of YouTube channels. If you're like me, you probably never do. But around here, it's kind of important. If you want to take our flight plans, you will always find the link for that in there, unless it's a flight that's just so short, or maybe we didn't have an airport to take off from if I had to drop a helicopter in somewhere, but pretty much 99% of our flights. And man, you know what? We've got like 160, maybe even 180 flights loaded up on this channel so far. We've been doing this for about 18 months and have that many flights up, which is just awesome. But every one of them will have the flight plan in there, so you can take it just like we are. Most of them I will set at a parking spot. If you need to take off from another direction, you can always just change that in the sim at the very last minute if you want to. Along with our bookmark file. So there's one of those things that was sticking up that we saw off in the distance. And you can see it does have trees on the top of it. And the bookmark file is global, so I always put the most recent one in all the video descriptions if you load that into a little nav map. And if you don't know how to do that, I also have a tutorial for that. I think it's all of like three minutes long. 
But that will put all of our bookmarks in there. And if you have not seen our satellite map tour at the end, you'll see what I'm talking about. I have bookmarks on all the things we're looking at on every flight, so you'll know where they are if you're tracking your flight in little nav maps. So you won't have to wonder what you're looking at down there, which is very helpful for folks who like to do that. And then also I have the link to our Discord server in there. And if you have not joined that yet, well, you should, because we have a very cool community of very cool people talking about all things aviation, plane reviews, scenery reviews, add-on reviews, and just general aviation trivia, different places to see around the world. I keep our upcoming schedule in there. And most of my conversations happen in there. I don't have a lot of lengthy conversations in the YouTube comments. But I do have a lot of conversations on the Discord server, so just click that. If you've never used Discord before, just click the link, get in there. It's so easy to use. I was so afraid to get in there because I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but it's ridiculously easy to use. So hop in there, check it out. And while you're in there, you can also participate in our quarterly flight plan recommendation competition. This is yet another member-recommended flight. I'm so grateful for that and so grateful. And well, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I'm glad I set that up because that's how we're finding places like this. And at the end of the quarter, we probably have a month left. Ooh, that doesn't look so good, does it? But at least we got a radio mast up there. That looks good. I think we've got probably four or five. This might be the fifth one for this quarter. We still have about a month left. And if we get to more than four, I'll probably pick my top four at the end of the quarter, post the link to those in the survey that I'll put in our community page in YouTube, and then we'll vote on those top four. And the winner will get a $50 gift card to the sim vendor of your choice, assuming they offer gift cards, and most of them do. So look forward to that probably in another three or four weeks. And finally, on the Discord page also, we have our group flights. We'll have another one in less than two weeks probably. This one will be out in California, set up by a member who lives out there. We're going to take that one at Turbo Props, maybe even this one, depending on how I'm feeling at the time. But we'll hop in the voice chat, get out the flight plan ahead of time, get out some designer notes so you'll know what we're going to be checking out. That's a lot of fun. We just flew over the Virgin Islands a couple weeks ago. Always a good time. We try to keep those at about an hour long. And even if you have no experience doing that, or if you feel like you're an inexperienced pilot, don't worry about it. We're not going to be doing all kinds of procedures and all that. So it's just to get out there and enjoy the conversation and enjoy the sights. All that and more in the Discord server. So check it out. I think we got like 85 people in there now. Really cool place. Well, we're close to the ground here. All right, so let's look on the little nav map. I think I'm going to stay here for a minute, because if we get much lower, I'm going to hit the ground. So we're just going to hang out here. Let me check the barrow. All right, we're pretty close on that. So we're going to be coming up on Gondar. That's the next big population sim that we're going to find. And it became the capital of the Ethiopian Empire, which rose to power in the mid-1200s AD, about 300 years after Axum fell, and lasted all the way up until 1974. Not this place is the capital, but the Ethiopian Empire. So Gondor wasn't always the center of power. It was founded by Emperor Facilides. Maybe Facilides? Not sure how to say that. Around 1635. And according to legend, the emperor was led by a buffalo out here, encountering an old and venerable hermit sitting by a natural pool. And the old feller told him to build his capital here, so he filled in the pool and erected a castle on top of it. And then five more emperors would subsequently build their own palaces in the area. And that is what we're going to see is the Ensign PO out here, the place where those are. It's an area called Facil Gebi. And I haven't flown close enough to check it out yet, so this will be the first time we've seen that. There's some more of that terracing. I would have adjusted the brightness setting, which you can do in the map enhancement thing, but when we did that over Greenland, it was making some of that popping happen, so I'm just going to leave it as is. That looks a little bit dark. I probably could have lightened that up a little bit, but it's good enough for me. There's also quite a few churches that were built out here to end epidemics which must have done the trick at least once, or I have to imagine they wouldn't have done it again. I think they built seven big churches out here. But Gondor remained the capital up until 1856 when it was relocated, but this place would remain a spiritual center for Jews, Muslims, and Christians, eventually gaining the moniker the City of Priests. And then starting in the mid-1800s, the city was repeatedly raided and torched by Sudanese invaders, and it was heavily bombed by the Brits during World War II as they were trying to clear out those fascist Italians who had been in Ethiopia since 1936, and they made their last stand right here in the town of Gondar. Okay, so let's see if we can see this thing, the area where all the castles are. And you can see them pretty well on the satellite map, which we'll check out at the end. So let's see if something just looks a little bit lighter than everything else. That's usually the giveaway. And I'm going to start coming down to 9,500 feet while we do that. And let's do it at 1,000 feet a minute. All right, so I think it was on the top of one of these big hills out here. Mm, no, nope, nothing looks more detailed than usual in any of that. Maybe out here? Nope, nope, nope. Oh, I bet this is it right here. 
Because I bet they would have built all that stuff on top of a big hill. Yep, that's got to be it. All right, we got 11 knot tailwind right now, which means we're going to have a crosswind coming in from our left. I'm guessing that's probably it, because that kind of looks castle-ish, doesn't it? I think it is. Looks good, though. Oh, and we're getting a little bit of popping. That's what happens when you get an add-on stuck in there. I don't know, though. That looks a little bit flat. Maybe that's not it. Well, oh, there's an airport. We got to get down. We got to get way down. All right, autopilot off. Cut the throttles. I might have to do a go-around. I didn't realize we were that close to this thing. No problem. Yep, we're going to do a go-around and come up from the other direction, because then we'll have a little bit of a headwind anyway, and I won't have to come down quite as much. All right, no problem. So that lake out in front of us is Lake Tana, and it's the largest in the country. It's got a surface area of about 1,200 square miles, but it only gets down to 50 feet deep at the deepest spot. So pretty shallow. And that's also the start of the Blue Nile. So you would take it from there up to, I guess, Sudan? Yeah, I think that's where it meets up with the White Nile and becomes the Nile River. Okay, let me just get myself reconfigured. I had to break off our flight plan here, so we'll just come around and do a short final. And bring on in. We're going to have to endure that little spot of the bad scenery, but that's fine. So, yeah, I think if you want to get a good look at Gondar, I'll probably redraw the flight plan for you guys and upload it so that we're coming in from the south. I need to watch your airspeed. All right, let me just, let me just be quiet for just a minute and kind of reconfigure myself, get everything back together, retrim this thing. Boy, you take that autopilot off and you can feel that wind now. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so gears can come out at 170, so we're good for that. Let's do that. One notch of flaps. We're going to do a real short final here. We'll do a fighter-style landing. Ooh, love the gear noise. That sounds great. So I'm not sure how long... I think the Blue Nile is shorter than the White Nile. And if you go all the way down to the other end of that lake, there's a whole bunch of little islands and stuff in there, which supposedly have a bunch of old Christian lore for that, too. I think the Ark may have been hidden on some of those little islands for a while, too. And it's hard to pin down exactly how many islands there are. I was reading some reports going back 300 years, and the number was anywhere from 21 to 45. So I don't know how many islands there really are. You can only see one huge one that's on the southern end. And there's also a big town down there by where the Blue Nile starts with a big runway. And I don't know if that one got ripped up by bulldozers or not. But I think it's about 8,000 feet. So if you want to cruise over there and check out the lake, I don't know how good it looks because I haven't done it yet, but it probably looks pretty good if you like lots of water. So those buildings look great from there, don't they? The shadows are just right, but wait till we come over the other side. They're going to be flat, unfortunately. If I can get this thing stopped in time, there's only one taxiway to pull off, and if I can hit it, we won't have to turn around, but even if we do, that's not that big of a deal. So we'll try that, and then we'll take a look at that satellite map. So what do you guys think of this area? Unbelievable. Just so cool. Another notch of flaps. See how slow we can get this baby. It says that our approach speed is going to be 150, and our VREF is 125, but last time I was in our, out here, I got it down to 100 without stalling, so we might do that just to see how slow we can get coming in here. Trim up a little bit. We're only going to be coming down at 1,500 feet a minute. And bring her on around. And final notch of flaps. Landing lights back on. Oh, now you can start to see the buildings are looking a little bit flat, and they're going to look real flat, and then we'll see that little ledge artifact off to our right. All right, runway, where are you? There we go. I think we're doing just fine here. As long as we don't stall, I think we're doing good. Some more little tributaries. So that river there may be the Takizi too, but I don't think it bends back up around. It's got to catch up with that reservoir somewhere, but that's a pretty big river. I don't think that's the Takizi. Come on down some more. Yeah, there is. There's just that one taxiway right in the middle. And boy, that terminal building looks totally flat too, but I don't think it is. So again, if you want to roll the dice with performance, these two airports are available as freeware add-ons. If you want to load them up. But I don't think the improvement is huge. Right, I'm just going to cut the throttle and we'll nosedive in here. Swoop on in. Well, not a real good precision landing, was it? But I think we're going to make it just fine. Turn around some more. Throttle up some more. Yeah, we got a pretty good wind. Well, now it's a direct headwind, but it's a pretty decent one. Looks like it's about nine knots. Oh. 
Ooh, a little bit rough. Yeah, that's alright, we had to deviate from the plan, but we pulled it off. We had to do it on the fly. Alright, throw the reverses on, get those flaps up. And look for our taxiway. Well, where are you? A little bit further down. Oh, it's just a tiny little building. Okay, so it's just a big open cement area over there. But they do have a building. Yep, this was a good flight. So the next place we're going to go, I would like to do a hometown flyover. If you live in a place anywhere in the world, just let me know about it. We haven't done one of those in a while. I love finding places that, you know, just out in the middle of nowhere, some little podunk place that has an interesting little bit of history. It doesn't have to be a ton of it. We can make it a short flight. But I'm kind of in the mood for a shorty. They're easier for me. And I love just finding interesting spots out in the middle of nowhere, especially if they look good. But it doesn't have to look great, as long as it's interesting. And someone, uh, I took a test flight with one of our other members last night, and he said that out in, by Mount Ararat, where the other Ark was supposed to have landed, also looks really good. So that would be a pretty cool flight to head out there, and we may do that. And of course, I'm still working on my helicopter exercises out at Victoria Falls. Yeah, not getting any better at all. <laughs> so we'll see how that progresses. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit the parking brakes and pull these guys off. That should shut it down. And let's take a look at little nav map here. See what all we got. All right, centering off, trail off. So up here at Axum. So these are the bookmarks I was talking about. If you load that into little nav map, it will bring you not just these, but check out how many other places we've been. Obviously not a lot of places in Africa. We need to get out there a little more often. And really not that many in Asia either. But once you get up here to Europe, this is where you'll see them all. So these are all flights that we've taken. And if you load that one bookmark file in, all these will show up everywhere in the globe. And if you want to take any of these flights, just watch the video, load it in. You'll already have your bookmarks in there if you put that file in there. So that can be very, very helpful if you don't want to search all that stuff yourself. All right, let's get back to Ethiopia here. So again, look at this now that I've told you about the size of it. Again, this is a Mercator projection, so Greenland looks massive, Antarctica looks massive. But everything right at the equator is about the size that it probably would be if you looked at it on the globe. As you move further away in each direction, it gets a lot bigger. So that's why Ethiopia looks small by comparison, but it's not. It's 26th largest in the world. Okay, so we left here, and I wish I could take this off so you could see all the trenches carved across this thing. But before you set up the flight plan, maybe just hop, a, have a, uh, hop in here and look at it so you can see all the trenches carved across this. They have ruined the runway. And in the Google map, which you can definitely see, they got asphalt over it. So we came around the top here, and here's the church where the Ark is. So this is the church that's modeled in the Sim. This is where they actually keep the Ark down here in this little thing right here. But that's the church that they modeled in the Sim. And if you watch all the documentaries, this is the place where the one guy is hanging out behind the fence. And then here's Dunger. This was the Palace of the Queen of Sheba. And I think that was it. Yeah, I think we nailed it. Oh, no, it was this thing I was looking at. So that was not it. That's what I pointed out when we were flying over. It's a bit smaller than that. And it looks like just southeast of that. But this is where the Palace of the Queen of Sheba supposedly was. And they have these big things called, I think they're called stele out here, which was what was very prevalent as tomb markers. And they're huge before Christianity set in. And they're really, really tall. And they've re-erected most of them. they got big fields of them out here. Oh, and you kind of see them. Look, there's the shadows of them. But that's pretty cool to check out, too. I doubt you could see it in the sim. Maybe the shadows. But those things were all over the place out here. So these guys were controlling the entire Indian Ocean trade. And look how far we are from the coast. So that's over 100 miles away. So they must have had some sprawl that was going way out there. And again, if the trade route was running from Rome down through here and over to India, I guess I could see how they could have some control over that. And I did see the total land area that this controlled. It was huge. I don't remember the number, but it was a lot of this area. Probably most of the Arabian Peninsula, too. Okay, so we came down from there and then came along these rivers. Here is that. Again, if you want to see where the dam should be, which you're not going to be able to see in the sim, all you can see is this side of it and this side of it. This whole area just looks horrendous. So don't bother flying out there. Unfortunately, it just looks real bad. I put a bookmark on this thing. That was that real, that tall, really sharp first peak we flew over, but there was no bookmarks of any kind in Google, so I don't even know what it's called. But it was definitely really high, but that's not the really big mountain. That's Ras Dashan out here, tallest in Ethiopia, that may have been on the rim of a huge volcano at some point. I don't know how huge, but it just said huge, which is a very relative term, I guess. And then here's where the big park is out here, going down to this big, huge valley. There's the Meshema, Meshesha River running through there. That looked just beautiful. That was incredible. So again, you'll want to be, until you can really see this thing coming up on you, sticking up, and you won't miss it because you'll fly right over it. I'd say about this first turn here, start going from 10,000 up to 14,000. And then once you get over this ledge here, you can come down to about 11,000. And then once you come on this side of this ledge, you could probably get down to 9,000 again. I'm going to redraw this so you're coming in from the south because you're just not going to be able to get a good look at Gondar if you take this approach. You're not going to have time to set up yourself for landing and all that, so I'll change that a little bit. And you can always readjust it if you want to. 
All right, let's see if we can find this on the map here. Well, I know we can find it on the map, but... Okay, so what was I looking at? It was on top of a mountain, but you can't tell where the tops of the mountains are. It looks like it's a lot more... This is the place that was modeled in the sim. This is an in-sim POI. And here's where all the different castles are that they built up here, which may or may not have been on top of a pool, and there may or may not have been a venerable old hermit out here that told the guy to build it there. But I guess we didn't spot that, because that looks like it would be more open in the sim. I think I was looking at something a little bit further over here. Uh, this is probably the top of that mountain we were looking at. Yeah, because there were stadiums and stuff down here. So I think I missed that. So it's going to be on the eastern edge of the town, just away from this lake here. Ooh, and another dam, too. Looks kind of like a mitten. So when you see this lake, just kind of look what... Let's see how far that is from there. So it's about a mile away from that. All right, and then see if you can spot it. We missed it, but let me know how it looks if you see it. A lot of interesting history there. And if you want to fly over the lake and check it out, here's Lake Tana, and then there's the one big island where the other 40 are, I don't know, unless you're calling all these little things islands. And then here's the other big airport. This is one of the only ILSs in the country. I think I found three other ILS approaches in the whole country, so if you feel like you want to do an ILS approach, you can hit it on that one. And if you're going to fly out here in real life, I think this is one of the better cities to come into. I've read it's relatively safe. And then there's where the Blue Nile starts. So that's it, guys. That's Northern Ethiopia. Very, very cool flight. Thank you so much to our member. This one will definitely make the cut for our quarterly flight plan competition. If you want to get in on that and all other things awesome, be sure to hop on that Discord server. The link will be in the video description. I had an absolute blast. Learned all kinds of incredible things, as always. And I can't wait to see you all again in the skies. Later.